Hi, Joe. Um, absolute pleasure to have you on the HR podcast. I know you're a busy man, especially in, in these times, crazy times at the moment. Um, well, um, especially with the recent news, the Prime Minister is in intensive care. I wish him a speedy recovery. With everything that's going on, how are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Um, I'm actually one of those people who is who is in a high risk category because uh, I've, I've actually been hospitalised twice with pneumonia over the years. Um, and a lot of it, I'll be honest with you here, is my own fault. Uh, I've been a smoker for over 40 years. Not bright, not intelligent. Any young people watching, don't do it. Um, so I kind of thought to myself over three weeks ago, do you know what? I think I better head for the country. So I'm at home in the North Downs in Kent. Um, and, I, you know, at the moment, to be honest with you, it's the most beautiful spring I could imagine that we've had for years. And uh, yeah, I'm OK. Uh, but I think what happened last night was really a bit of a shock because, do you know, when you see a headline that says 684 people died yesterday, another 4,000 were confirmed as being infected. Unless it's somebody that you personally know, it's just a statistic. And I think that one of the reasons we've seen quite a lot of young people just completely ignoring social distancing rules, uh, you know, thinking this can't affect them, is because it's just a number. It's over there somewhere. When the prime minister, who everybody knows, has got access to the best health care in the world, when he goes into intensive care, I think the nation was truly shocked to its roots last night. And I, I must say for myself, I wasn't surprised because I'd seen the five o'clock press conference. I'd seen the body language from the chief medical officer. I'd seen Dominic Raab kind of pretending that Boris was still in charge. And then when, and then when he was asked, when did you last speak to him? Say Saturday. You know, it just didn't add up. Uh, so I wasn't surprised. I was expecting the worst. But yeah, this is a big collective shock to the nation and I think to the world actually. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. A lot of people, um, regardless of their political beliefs, are putting their, of their faith in Boris. Um, obviously we want it to pull through, but we also, we also on an emotional level, we also need we need it to pull through um, just to just keep the he head on the game. I mean, we, with that said, we know how, how resilient and how fiercely determined the general public, the British general public can be in times of war and in times of crisis, which is what we're going through now. And perhaps yourself, more than anybody, knows how just prior to this, this crisis, how divided the nation had become over the whole Brexit saga. With that in mind, um, and that determination and resilience that the British public can have, is it possible that some good for us could come from this COVID-19 situation, that being a society on the mend, communities becoming closer together? Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, you know, I was brought up being, to, being told about the Blitz spirit, that, you know, when London was being bombed, when, when, when Liverpool was being bombed, when tens of thousands of innocent people, even babies, were being killed, and yet people realised we had to pull together. Now, because the truth of it is that a crisis brings out the best and the worst in people because you get profiteers, you get black marketeers, you get people that, uh, you know, con men, uh, you know, robbing old ladies. So you get the best and the worst that come out. But what I want to say is this. I think that to ask the people to volunteer, to put themselves forward, to, you know, go to the pharmacy to get drugs, to get shopping delivered to those who are, you know, seriously at risk from this virus, to have produced a response in a week of 700,000 people. Nothing like this has happened since that poster went up in August 1914 with Kitchener pointing a finger. Nothing like it has happened for over 100 years. And what it shows you, actually within this country, within all communities in this country, there is a lot more good than bad. So, yep, absolutely. I also think this, I think we've spent the last 40 or 50 years heading towards mad materialism, where you would have thought from government that all that mattered were GDP numbers, even though, you know, most kids under 40 can never afford a house in the way their parents or grandparents did, that people working in London go to work in third world travel conditions, uh, that people have got debt 
up to here, you know, personal debt, corporate debt, national debt, and boy, that'll be bigger after this crisis. And that somehow, you know, provided your car is one registration plate newer than the next door neighbor, that is what success is. Even though your life is completely blooming miserable for 48 weeks every year. And I do think that this time of reflection for vast numbers of people, I hope and I pray it makes us reevaluate, firstly, what matters in life, secondly, the importance of community and family and friends, even though I know we're getting on each other's nerves a bit at the moment, but I, and, and obviously, um, but I also hope at a national level, it makes us rethink our place in the world. You know, I have always believed that we should be an independent, self-governing nation. Um, and whilst we want to trade and be friendly with all parts of the world, you know, I think what's happened here, you know, it makes me reassess. If a widget that's produced in China and designed for the just-in-time supply chain for some giant corporation just happens to be a smidgen cheaper than a widget produced in Salford, I want to buy the widget produced in Salford. And I think there'll be a move to thinking, how can we make sure in times of crisis, because you never know, you know, as human beings, what's around the corner, how can we start to become a bit more self-sufficient? Self-sufficient industrially, self-sufficient in terms of our energy needs. And I also think, you know, when you go to a famous sandwich chain and buy a chicken sandwich, it's probably been imported from Thailand. And I think one of the results of this is we will start to think about buying local. We may even start to think about growing some more of our own. So I'm sorry it's a long answer to your question, but yes, actually, I do genuinely think that a shock, a complete shock to the system, a reevaluation of ourselves, our country, and the way in which we live, I do believe those things are possible, yes. Re really good points. The, the value, um, <coughs> just, just on it, the, the value that, um, as you quite rightly insinuated there, the value that we were assigning to those small and medium-sized enterprises we didn't care for before, but, but not only that, we... we we look to soldiers generally as, as the heroes. And there's a big move around now. The NHS has been the heroes and, and other um, frontline services. And it's not absolutely true. The way I see that impacting things really positively right now is my children now have a, have a different respect for the NHS over the last few weeks than, than what they did before. I could never have taught them myself to have respect for the NHS. This is the biggest thing. They stand outside the door clapping for the NHS. you know, yeah. and, and I think that's a really good indicator of things to come, and especially on the financial side. Small, medium-sized enterprises, we do need to, to support those ones that are still alive after Well, this. and isn't this the problem? Isn't this the problem? You see, uh, OK, it's a time of crisis, but we still have to be critical where it can be constructive to be critical. Rishi Sunak's business loan scheme is a disaster. It's not working. Because if you go along to the bank as a small or medium-sized business owner, and say, I want to borrow this money. They've been asking for personal guarantees on your, on your limited company, namely your house, and charging interest, even though they're borrowing money from the government, the Bank of England, at 0.1 of a percent, charging small businesses up to 23%. And a lot of businesses are saying, Do you know what? We're in trouble anyway. The last thing we need is more debt at high interest rates. And, and so one of my big concerns here is a recent study said that by the beginning of May, nearly a million small businesses could be genuinely insolvent in this country. And I, again, we've prayed to the gods of global business far too much over the course of the last 20 years. They've dominated the narrative. They've dominated our political class in Westminster. It's the five and a half million that run the small businesses that create the jobs and the real wealth within the private sector in our economy. And so this is now the biggest challenge we face. <clears throat> we know that testing on whether you've got it or not 
the antigen test as, as being completely shambolic. But we'd hoped that the antibodies test, where the government were starting to order large amounts, might offer us a way out of this. Now we learn that the test isn't reliable. Now, I won't blame the government for that. I won't, I won't blame the government for doing things that don't work. I'll blame them for not doing things when there is a need to. But at some point, and it's not yet, but at some point, we have to think, what is our exit strategy from the current lockdown? You know, I mean, my local garden centre is just two miles away. Now, I can go to the supermarket and queue up, keeping a six foot distance from the person in front and behind. But I can't go to my garden centre. It's a family owned business. How long can he survive? You know, and, and we have to think about this now. Boris Johnson is in intensive care with the best will in the world. He's going through an ordeal and it's going to take him a long time to recover. In fact, you know something, he's probably as ill as he is because he's carried on working despite having some pretty unpleasant symptoms. It is going to be, and we've got to face up to this, it is going to be some time before the Prime Minister is back on top of his game. And it's going to leave people like Dominic Raab with the most astonishing level of responsibility. At what point do you start to free up the economy? At what point do you give a lot of our small businesses the chance not to go insolvent? <clears throat> the upside is my local garden centre will start taking money. The downside is if you put people out into the population and you've not been able to antibody test whether they've had this thing and are now probably going to be immune to it, you risk a massive second wave of infection that perhaps the lockdown was designed to stop in the first place. And that, as I say, you know, expect the three week lockdown to be renewed for a further three weeks. I mean, that's almost a gimme, I think. But as we head into middle end of May, these are monumental decisions that our government is going to have to take. And um, Austria are perhaps leading the way on this. The Austrians have decided two things. The first of which I think is incredibly sensible. The Austrians have decided that face masks are compulsory. And I can't imagine why we haven't done that. Beyond me, why we haven't done that. Secondly, from the 14th of April, namely the day after the Easter period is over, non-essential shops in Austria will reopen. And on the 1st of May, um, hairdressers, shopping malls will reopen. So the Austrians are trying to plan a timeline out of this, keeping social distancing, observing stricter hygiene rules than we currently are in this country with a view to getting the economy moving. And I'm not saying to you this morning that what the Austrians are doing is perfect, but I am saying, think about it. Let's keep an eye and see what happens in Austria over the course of the next few weeks. Yeah, I think it's it's difficult to keep uh, the balance with the the, the economic recovery and I uh, maintain a, a grip on the spread of the virus. I mean, yeah. going back, you you were talking about the, all the volunteers coming forward. Now, do you think in the future that um, it would be a serious consideration to look at national service again? Not so much for defence <laughs> against foreign powers. Yeah. but more for a defence at home and have those trained to a certain level volunteers here at the, at the drop of a hat? Well, I mean, think about the last few months. Floods, horrendous floods that have occurred in parts of the country uh, where the emergency services were completely overwhelmed. They did not have enough people. You know, more people within the local community trained who know exactly what to do when the river gets to a certain level would, of course, be a good thing. I mean, I... You know, David Cameron talked about this concept of the big society, that somehow the government was going to create a big society. And well, I won't tell you the words I thought about that. Actually, the big society in much of our country exists already. You know, the big society is making sure your elderly neighbours OK. The big society are people who volunteer to run the local scout group or girl guide group. There is a big society in this country. The difficulty with national service. As soon as you even mention the phrase, you know, it drums up images of drill sergeant majors in the 1950s and terrified 18 year olds. And a lot of people will say, we can't go back to that. Uh, the nation's youth 
wouldn't put up with it. Uh, I, I personally think that you're right. I think some form, and, and as you say, you could opt for a military option, you could opt, opt for a, a civil role. I think some form of that actually would be rather good and might just instill a bit of pride in people, might even teach a lot of people a skill or a trade that they might be able to use, you know, in civilian life. So I'm with you on the concept of it. The difficulty is how the hell do you implement it? Because you have to have the army of people, to tra army in military and Point. civilian sense. You have to have the army of people there to train and teach. So it could be done, but I very much doubt you could do it without at least three years' notice. Yeah, I just I'm not suggesting we do it. It was suggested for consideration. I'm undecided, and then I just because it also brings the standard of the British forces down. I, I yeah, think of course. National Service. Oh, oh, absolutely. That's absolutely right. It would do. Um, so you can imagine just how many people would need to be retired off from our current tiny British army. Uh, you know, the smallest army we've had since since Queen Anne. So, yeah, you know, the idea that we engage young people in their community, make them part of it, almost whether they like it or not, uh, I think would do, would do a lot of good. But in practical terms, it's a long way away. How did the World War I battlefield tours that you used to conduct come about? That was a surprising one I read about, yeah. So. <laughs> I wasn't so, expecting it. Yeah, no, no, Farage is Foragers. I have been the length of the Western Front in France. I've been to Gallipoli in Turkey twice. Um, uh, you know, so it, it was a subject of great interest to me. I'll tell you how it started. Like so many of us, you know, or maybe you're a, a bit younger than me, but like so many of us, I had a grandfather who was, a, who was an August 14 volunteer and who fought in France and was quite badly wounded in the First World War. Um, and so there is that sort of family bit of history. But I'll tell you what happened. I worked in the commodities business before politics, copper, aluminium, stuff like that. And we'd have really busy days and really quiet days. Now, the quiet days, you know, I'd sit with my feet on my desk, reading the newspapers, getting ready for lunch, if I'm being honest with you. And I remember several times looking at the obituary columns in the Times, Telegraph, newspapers, and you'd read about Fred, who just died age 94, who in 1917, had held a pillbox at eat for 24 days with two of his mates. And, and, and I said to some of the lads I work with, you know, isn't it interesting? Some of these old boys on walking sticks that we see in the street are actually the last of that generation that, 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 that went through these remarkable things. And I found three others, there were four of us, all, and all of us said we'd never been to but the Belgium or French battlefields, and we'd all like to go. And we went, well, went on a trip, and we met a bloke out there. He was 93, and he'd fought all through the First World War, and he was in tip-top form, had a wife who was 40 years younger. Maybe that was the reason, I don't know. And we got talking to this guy. We visited these amazing places. We saw the, the last post ceremony played at the Menin Gate in Ypres, They've just had their 30,000th uh, commemoration of that. It's there every night, 365 days a year. We visited Vimy Ridge and saw the scarred chalk battlefield that the Canadians took in 1917. We went down to the Somme and looked at where the Kitchener armies had such a miserable time on the 1st of July, 1916. And a combination of being fascinated by these places and meeting somebody who'd been there. That's what spurred me on. I thought, if I'm going to do this, I better do this properly. And so I went to the 75th anniversary of the Gallipoli landings to meet some of the last survivors who'd been there in 1915. I went to the 75th anniversary of the Somme in 1991, where 120 uh, people, three quarters of a century to the day, were back on the battlefield. And I wanted to try and pack as much of it in whilst those people were still alive. And I'm very pleased that I did it. And I can tell you, I'm now doing much the same with our rapidly diminishing and dwindling number of World War II veterans. Um, I'm a patron and supporter of a local Battle of Britain museum here in Kent. Um, and, you know, even five years ago, 
on Easter Sunday, when we opened up the museum for the year, there'd be four or five blokes there who'd spoke, flown Spitfires and Hurricanes. And of course, that just doesn't happen anymore. So I, 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 for me, for me, it's about the human side of this. And I'm, I'm utterly fascinated by you know, what makes ordinary blokes do extraordinary things. I'm completely and utterly fascinated by it. And you know something, and this applies a little bit more perhaps to men than women because of our upbringing. But I mean, my school, my school in the two wars got seven Victoria Crosses and one George Cross. And when we were kids there, you know, remembrance, yearly remembrance parade was a big part of the school. And you looked, there were over 850 boys from my school killed in two world wars, four entire years of people killed in those two wars. And because it was a, you know, semi-posh private school, they were, you know, second lieutenants on the Western Front and things like that. And I have to say that part of the fascination for me, when I go and stand on the Somme or whatever it is, I say to myself, if I'd been 19 years old, you know, and, 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 and given a whistle um, and a revolver, what would I have done? Of course, the answer, and you've been through this, you know more about it than I do. But I guess the truth is, we never, ever quite know how we'll respond or what we'll do as people until we're being tested. And in some ways, and I thought the Queen put it beautifully the other evening, though this is very different to 1940, in some ways, our society, our community, our way of life is now being tested. And I rather agree with the Queen that actually we will come through all of this through resilience and good humoured resolve. And all I can say is, God save the Queen. She's absolutely marvellous. I agree. I agree. Did, did, did you ever think about joining up? I did. Yes, I did. Um, I was, um, I did combined cadet force at school for five years. Um, I went and had the army interview uh, and I was on the verge of doing it. Um, I didn't do it because had it been four or five years earlier, I would have joined up. But in, in, in that period, in 1981, we had just had a, a massive economic change in Britain. The old socialist model was out. Um, we had exchange controls gone. And there was this new phenomenon called the yuppie. And these were young people going into business, making lots of money. And I'm afraid the lure of money took me away from the British Army. And that's the truth of it. <laughs> I, that, uh, yeah, I'm sure that story, that story has been being told by, by many other people as well. <laughs> well, I'm just conscious, conscious of your time. We, we're nearly done. Um, on the subject of war and uh, your friend, the President of the United States, well, yeah. who you have probably got a better understanding or uh, knowledge of him as a person than most. Now, I think one of the things that's overlooked with him, from my perspective, is the amount of positive progress that he has made, um, political progress, relationship progress, communications with North Korea, China and Russia, compared to anyone else, uh, all of the previous presidents and all without, the, with, without direct military intervention. What, what makes him different? How is he... A, how is he able to do that and achieve those things with nations that were otherwise untouchable? You see, way back in the 1950s, Dwight Eisenhower, who, of course, had, had, had led Allied forces through the D-Day and Normandy campaign, Dwight Eisenhower, back in the 1950s, identified something called the military-industrial complex, right? It's in the interests of big business that produce expensive kit to use it, to be absolutely frank with you. And what went before Trump? It didn't matter whether they were badged as Democrats, whether they were badged as Republicans. For them, going to war was the first option, as opposed to what it should be, the last resort. And they were all swept up in this sort of global corporate narrative that goes on. The Donald comes from outside of that world. The Donald comes from Queens, New York. The Donald is a real estate guy. The Donald is rough and tough. He's had some big ups and some big downs. He's lived a bit, you know, in every sense of the word. And for him, he takes the alternative view. 
his view and it's my view, is make sure your forces, your defences are big enough, strong enough, well equipped enough, but hope you never have to use them. And, and, and far from, you know, the, the, these idiots in the New York Times and CNN all saying Trump will lead us to World War Three. I mean, goodness me, when he crossed that line and stepped into North Korea, that was, I thought, a truly astonishing, remarkable moment. I know this guy isn't everyone's cup of tea. I know this guy is seen to be a bit brash and a bit out there. Do you know something? I've got to know him quite well over the last four years. And I mean, and, you know, to be honest, he's, you know, he is a friend. And we can have honest, friendly conversations with each other that are utterly confidential, and I never share any of the content of them. But at heart, you know, the guy believes that the nation state is the right building block through which we should live. The guy believes that ordinary men and women who want to have a go in life need to be given an even break. The guy believes that the world has been far too dominated by big multinational corporations and attempts at bringing us into forms of global government. And yeah, he may send out some tweets at half past five in the morning that shock people. You know, he may have a style that is completely outside the box for what you'd expect from an American president. But you know what? I think he's doing a great job. Or as he would say, great job. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> sometimes you need someone completely out of the box to shake things up, yeah, either absolutely. positively or negatively, and everyone takes heed, you know. Absolutely, and that's what's happening with him, whether you like whether you like him or not. Um, finishing off, Nigel, with everything that's going on now, what are we going to look like in twenty years' time in the UK for a military or even globe on a global scale, military, political, financial, perhaps? Three predictions. Well, I think that I think that these false supranational structures like the European Union will be swept away by what's going on now. Uh, I think there'll be a radical reassessment of the World Health Organization, who appear to be being paid by the Chinese to praise the Chinese for what's happened, for goodness sake. I think there are going to be two different worlds. I think there'll be an English speaking world. That is, in, that is, whilst they're all independent, will actually be tighter knit than it's been over the course of the last few years. And I think there'll be a Chinese dominated world, which is a much more authoritarian, different kind of model. And I think that's the way the world is going. I am deeply fearful of what China's becoming. I find it very, very worrying. And I find it alarming that our younger generation don't seem to understand it. Now, when I tell my own kids, do you realize there are hundreds of thousands of Muslims in China in re in, in interned, in re-education camps? They just don't understand that. Yet, they know plenty about what happened in Germany in the 1930s and all the rest of it. And I think, I think there needs to be, amongst our youth, a, a complete reappraisal of what China represents in this world. And, and I... I hope and pray after this that we get China out of our 5G network uh, and start buying British. <laughs> I agree. I hope it's not going to be like that. Sounds like a lot of conflict, but uh, yeah. Well, I, I'm sorry, but I, you know, I, you know, I, I'm giving you a truthful answer. These are the two great spheres of influence in the world. It is the China model, and it's the uh, and it is the predominantly Anglo-Saxon model. And the, the thought the two of them are going to come together, forget it. It ain't going to happen. It can't work. Do you see, what about the Arabian Peninsula, Saudi, UAE? Do you, do you see them not having a big influence in the future? Well, I very much hope that with the oil price down through the floor, whilst that may not be a good thing for many of us with our pension funds, uh, that it means that never again, never again, can countries like them or Putin's Russia hold the West to ransom. And I think energy... So much trouble over the years has been caused. So many wars have been caused, frankly, by oil, that I would like to see us, like America, becoming more uh, independent in terms of energy production. Yeah, me too. And I paid one pound nine p for filling up my car yesterday, which was a I joy. I hear there's one supermarket selling at ninety nine p. So hey, it's not all bad. Really? You can tell me that after this. <laughs> I want to thank you very much for having me on. 
and and thank you for the service that you've given our great country. I appreciate it, Nigel. You too. Stay safe, Nolis, and good luck. Thank you.